Today, I'm going to talk about sensor-based modeling and optimization of additive manufacturing. So, uh, so here, there's a, a, a variation called SIMS3D. SIMS3D stands for uh, Center for Innovative Material Processing, uh, actually 3D printing. So this work, this project is primarily collaborated with uh, SIMS3D. And also today's talk will be primarily based on this paper, Six Sigma Quality Management of Additive Manufacturing, which is a review paper summarizing a, a series of paper in the area of quality assurance, quality control uh, of uh, additive manufacturing. So for more details, if you are interested, you can dive into this paper to know more. Um, so why can we get together today in person? Because uh, it's complex because, because of the COVID-19. However, uh, Zoom give us the flexibility now let's get together uh, virtually. So special thanks to uh, Dr. Xiao Lei Fang and uh, Dr. Uh, Na and uh, uh, Dr. Lin Kanbian, the president of uh, QCRE Society, and uh, also QCRE, all the board members and uh, and the community for the for the opportunity to present my uh, for me to present my work in this webinar. So in the beginning, I would like to thank my uh, research collaborators. So I have learned so much from my research collaborators on 3D printing. So uh, Dr. Prahalad Rao uh, is my uh, academic brother and he's uh, well known in 3D printing. And Dr. Uh, Simpson, uh, Dr. Simpson was the director of Sims3D. And uh, as you may see, this is actually a 3D printed like uh, statue of Dr. Simpson. So, uh, so now you can see what 3D printing can do. It looks like a real person. And uh, Dr. Yan Lu from List and, uh, and Dr. Ted Russo from Sims3D and uh, Dr. Paul Vizero from uh, List, uh, Abdallah Lazar uh, from Sims3D and Dr. Sanda Kumara and also my advisor, uh, Dr. Satish Pukaparanam. Yeah, without uh, the uh, support and help and also guidance and uh, my research uh, uh, work would not, uh, would not have reached this far. And thank you very much to my uh, research collaborators. So at Penn State, I run a lab called the Complex Systems Lab. So uh, I, my research focus on uh, sensor-based modeling and optimization of complex systems. So applications, uh, including uh, manufacturing and healthcare. So no matter it's a manufacturing system or healthcare system, and we have sensors like uh, IoT sensors, Internet of Things sensors. Previously, we called a wireless sensor network. And then if you connect those wireless sensor network to the internet, it will become uh, IoT enabled uh, sensor network. And those sensors collect a lot of data. If you have thousands of sensors, it will become supervisory control and a data acquisition system. We also call it a SCADA system. So SCADA is widely used in the industry. No matter it's hospital, power plant, chemical plant, manufacturing plant, and we use those sensors to increase the information visibility and also address the system complexity. But advanced sensing brings uh, uh, big data. So how in industrial engineering, we focus on uh, sensor-based process monitoring, modeling, and uh, analysis including uh, system informatics and control, data analytics for knowledge discovery and decision making, and also definitely quality and reliability engineering. And also uh, you can leverage those data to calibrate com computer, uh, computer models and doing the computer experiments and the simulation optimization. Mm, in the reliability side, of course, you can use the model to do the prognosis, um, maintenance, and optimization. So, theoretical foundation is actually I focus on the nonlinear dynamics. So, this is something that is a little bit uh, I, I want uh, uh, different from majority of the uh, 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 researchers in the IE field. So, I focus on the nonlinear dynamic system theory, statistics, and the signal processing, simulation, optimization, and control theory. Those are the theoretical foundations to support the sensor-based modeling and optimization. So uh, uh, also uh, I would like to thank my research team and they really they are really uh, the people who behind those uh, work and research work. Uh, 
so my uh, my students, this is a picture we took in Seattle, and I I haven't had a chance to meet with all of my students. They are all my, all the students in my lab. I haven't seen that group. Then we took this picture, and many of them have been tenured associate professor and uh, assistant tenure track assistant professor, and uh, some of them uh, they are working for industry as well. This is another picture with my uh, healthcare colleagues and at the hospital. And uh, I, I, I went to the hospital and tried to uh, work with them on the healthcare problems. And we had this picture together. Uh, at Penn State, I also supervised the senior design and the undergraduate uh, research. So those are, uh, this is a picture with uh, undergrad students. And this is also a picture with my uh, uh, undergrad research students at my lab, uh, Juan Gomez. And he's a Schreier Honor student. And uh, I'm very glad to have an opportunity to learn from my students, also has the opportunity to work with them in the research project. Leverage the research project, really build the successful development uh, of my students and uh, their career. So now let me uh, get into the additive manufacturing. So, uh, additive manufacturing provides uh, new design freedoms. As you can see from this picture, it make, uh, uh, make it possible to fabricate those complex geometry uh, uh, products and uh, which, were, uh, was, which was not possible if you use the traditional manufacturing, for example, the subtractive and the machine cutting. And it's impossible to uh, reach such uh, complicated uh, geometry. And also if you see the top, uh, Top right, you see the this icon, right? That's my hand actually holding a ball. That's a nested ball. Within the bigger ball, you will see a smaller one. Those kind of structure can only be uh, be done through the additive manufacturing. So additive manufacturing provide a, a faster speed to go from the design. If you have an idea and a design idea, you can put it in the CAD model, and then you can go with the materials processing steps and uh, put it in the computer or 3D printer and you can print the part. And uh, also it enables mass customization. So mass customization means that some of the, some of the for some of the times, if you do a, a product with 3D printing, you might only print it once with that, not like the traditional mass uh, manufacturing, mass, mass production is you have the same design, you produce uh, thousands, millions of them. But uh, now 3D printing allows you to have the flexibility to produce only one part. We call it, we often call it one of a kind manufacturing. And because of the complex geometry, sometimes it offers expanded function application. And the speed actually reduces the life cycle cost. So for those who uh, is not very familiar with uh, additive manufacturing, let me give a, a brief introduction of what is manufa uh, additive manufacturing. So if you have a uh, design, and then you cut it in the layered sequence, okay? And then you put this design into the 3D printer. And then you use a coater to spray a layer of the powder. It could be metal powder. And now you use a laser to fuse those powder together to form one layer, okay? Once you finish this layer, you're gonna load down the powder bed and then you spray another layer of the powder, and now you fuse it again. Then layer by layer, layer upon layer, you will be able to get the final part, a final build, okay? This is a laser powder bed fusion process. Once this is done, and you sweep the powder off the powder, uh, the bed, and then you can get the final part out. So this is a 3D printing. And uh, this video is a brief version that, uh, that is available in this YouTube link, if you are interested. So as you can see, if you have a design idea, and traditionally you can go, you need to go through commercial manufacturing supply chain. You need to go through the prototype phase and then manufacture system. You need to build the manufacturing or production system. And then all these products come, will come to the distribution center and there will be the warehouse to store those. And then it was transported to the retail, uh, retailing store. And then it will reach the end customer. 
But, but additive manufacturing gives you the flexibility to bypass the traditional linear supply chain. And you, if you have a design idea, you can submit the CAD model and it, you can get it printed somewhere with a supplier. And then it will get mailed back to the end customer. Okay, so this is another, another paradigm. We call it manufacturing as a service. So MAAS, as you can see, we have, this is becomes two-sided uh, two market. You have manufacturers, additive manufacturing manufacturers, and uh, you have providers and you also have customers. So customer with the design, they can come to the online marketplace and the provider just mail them back. So about this manufacturing as a service platform and how do you enable the sharing economy of additive manufacturing? So uh, we know that we have Uber, right? And uh, all this uh, uh, like DoorDash and all, all this like uh, sharing economy and Airbnb. But uh, what about the manufacturing? Can we enable a sharing economy for manufacturing? As, as we can see here, we call it manufacturing as a service. So this is one paper about our idea, how to use uh, uh, matching theory to realize or to implement the sharing uh, economy of additive manufacturing. So matching theory is the Nobel Prize winning theory in economics. Now, can we uh, translate those kind of theory to manufacturing and make, make, make a better manufacturing uh, uh, system or manufacturing world? So if you are interested about uh, interested at sharing eco uh, economy and uh, manufacturing supply chain, and uh, you may refer to this paper. This is just a published in the past month. So this is not just talking. And as you can see here, Penn State has uh, about 20 major campus. So it's a Commonwealth campus, not just located in UP. UP University Park is the main campus, but we have 20 more Commonwealth uh, campus distributed in, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. So what are we, in, in this paper, what are we trying to do is to, to Build a digital fabrication network. So for example, at uh, UP, we have Nanot building, IST building, all these buildings, they provide uh, FDM additive, powder bed uh, additive and metal printers. And also we have traditional subtractive manufacturing. Okay. And how do we provide this kind of service to all the students? So the students can submit their design and get it processed somewhere. Uh, in the in the UP campus or other campus. And then once the part is manufactured, they can be shipped back to the students, okay, through the campus mail. So this is called uh, digital fabrication network. And this is a small version of sharing economy, but it, which is implemented in the Penn State system. But think about it, we can extend it this to the, uh, to the whole uh, United States or to the whole world. Uh, so additive manufacturing is wonderful, but there is a great challenge, which is a quality control. And we, which will come to the industry engineering, also come to the IISE, QCRE division. And we have so many researchers working on the quality control. But additive manufacturing, we did a case study at Sims3D. And this is from uh, uh, Andrew Coward and uh, Dr. Simpson. So we use the same CAD model, the same machine, okay? And uh, we print seven parts in the same bed, okay? Same time, but a very different results, okay? Only two out of seven were built defect free. And uh, others, they have different kinds of problems, the internal defects, or you have problems like in this layer, or you have malformed things. So the process has a very big variability. Now, then how do we overcome this kind of variability, quality control, can we just print and pray? As my colleague, like Dr. Prahala Rao said, <laughs> should we just print and pray? Or we should have a better control method. And this will comes to the sensor-based in-process control. And those kind of defects, they cause functionality problems. You know, uh, fatigue failure of a powder uh, metal oil can do it in a Qantas airplane, Airbus A380 jet engine. And uh, November 4th, 2010, Qantas uh, Flight 32 caused big problems in the, in the engine, actually blow the whole engine into the 
into the building and cause serious damage. So the, the problem is caused by a 3D printed part with internal defect. Because, because in the aircraft engine, they need to have very complex like a uh, uh, fuel to be injected to the compressor and uh, they have complex design. And if there's internal defect, then uh, the, the fuel we got, we got uh, some problems and then the engine got blown away. So this caused serious problems. This is an example. Uh, if the quality is not well controlled, what kind of damage it can, uh, it can make. Now, uh, before we really get into the uh, quality control and uh, Let's first define the, what is quality and what are, what are the challenges in the quality and reliability in additive manufacturing. So let's follow the Six Sigma AM. But first, we define the quality challenge and also the customer requirements. So for example, FAA application, which will be different from a traditional consumer application. And the measurement, how do we measure? If we define the challenge, how do we get the data? How do we, uh, what kind of sensors? And what kind of metrology measurements should we make? Now, if we get data, how do we analyze the data to extract useful information? So we call this D, M, A, I, C. Then if you analyze the data, you got insights, and then we can improve uh, doing the design of experiments or doing the simulation model or computer experiments. And then we can process, plan the process and optimal, uh, optimize the quality management. We can control the process. So in today's talk, we will, uh, I will go through each block. So first block is to define the quality challenge. So what is the quality challenge? What's the difference between traditional manufacturing and additive manufacturing? So traditional manufacturing, like the uh, mass manufacturing, it's high volume, no mix. So high volume, no mix means you produce a lot of parts. They are identical to each other. So now, if the, if the same process manufacture many parts, they are similar to each other. Then for example, here in part one, two, three, four, uh, four and two N. And then it's uh, very much easier for you to quantify and have a distribution. And then you can quantify the variability. And then you, you try to design experiments to really reduce the process variability or machine variability when they produce the parts. Quality, when we define quality, quality is inversely proportional to variability. So here we have, we have data and we have high volume product that can give us flexibility to quantify the variability and then we can reduce the variability. But the challenge in, in additive manufacturing is, is sometimes it's a one of a kind of manufacturing. So one of a kind of manufacturing means you only produce one. Now how do you quantify the variability? But fortunately, for even for the same part, and you build many layers, right? So each layer can serve as the quality inspection point. And then you have more data that can enable you, uh, that can enable the quality of, of variability study. So as I, as I uh, write here, AM, LS 3D printing offers the design uh, the flexibility to customize the design and uh, allow you to do the low volume and high mix production. But as you can see, there are layer wise geometry differences in the 3D printing. So, but if we can do the in process sensing and layer wise sensing, or even if you do the laser like fusion, you have multiple and point wise sensing, then you will have a lot of like a flexibility to do the quality control and the quantify the variability of the process. For details, you may refer to uh, this paper. So let, let me give you guys an example. What is the quality challenge? For a multi-layer AM build quality, if the probability to contain defects is 0.0114 in a layer, then what's the probability for this layer to have no defects? So this is about 1% that is a defect. I mean, if it is 1% of the 99%, there is no defect. So it's 98.86. Pretty good on one layer, but is this good enough? For AM build with 100 layers, if every layer, the probability is like this, okay? What's the probability for this build with 100 layers to have no defects? Then every layer have to be like uh, contain 
uh, have to be containing no defects. So this will be your power 100. It's about 31%, 31.77%. This is about true, right? Two out of seven, they're defect free. And uh, so now you see the challenge. For a build with 100 layers, the probability of fail then use one minus this, then 68.23% the probability to fail. So if the probability of build to have internal defects is, if you wanted them, this is a 68% to fail. That means a very large probability will fail. But if you want it to fail, failure probability to be less than 10%, then what should it be the probability for a layer to have no defects? Then you can solve this. Actually, you have to reach 0.0011% for one layer to have no defect. So this comes to the six sigma. If you want to realize that, you have to have six sigma AM quality management. As you can see, if we can achieve six sigma, and you see plus minus three sigma is 99.73%. If you go to six sigma, plus minus six sigma, it will be 99.999 and 698%. So parts per million defective, and this will be the layer defective. It will be very low. So now we have, we have uh, gone through the, uh, the quality challenging AM that is different from the traditional manufacturing. Now, how do we uh, measure the data and what kind of sensors do we use? So the engineering problem, this is by courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Prahalara Rao. One inch tall miniature uh, turbine blade takes over three hours to do the X-ray CT. But XFAA mandates every AM part to be qualified. So it takes time and a lot of money to qualify, uh, qualify a new part used purely empirical testing, okay? So this is a post build. And if, if in, also in the post build, if you find problems, you cannot really fix it in the process. You have to scrap the part. And that, that will be producing, a, that will pro, have a lot of waste if, you, uh, if the, it's, we can only do the post build inspection. So an alternative solution is in situ sensing and quality control of the AM part. Qualify as you build. So AM, so you have design phase, and then you have material. So material, we first we need to qualify the material because you have powders. Make sure the powder, the distribution, how to characterize the powder, what kind of characteristics of the powder, powder. Uh, and also powder requirements for the suppliers and the reuse, how do you reuse the powder? Because you see we sweep off a lot of uh, powders. And uh, you also see we have process, Process is a system qualification, especially the sensing technology and process monitoring and diagnostics. And after you build the part and we have the product, we also need to do the performance qualification. So you can do the post processing, like thermal processing, post process finishing. And then we also need to do the post build inspection. So now in this talk, I'm going to focus on the middle part, uh, the sensing technology and process monitoring and diagnostics. So if we do this material process product, then it will come to the adoption implementation. So at Penn State Sim3D, we have uh, uh, integrated an advanced multi-sensor suit into a commercial 3D system ProX320 uh, PBF. PBF stands for Powder Bed Fusion AM system. The sensors include uh, the imaging system and the high speed, high magnification cameras and high speed video and the optical process emission acoustic sensors. And here we also have uh, thermal imaging. Um, so this is a thermal melt pool. When you fuse, use a laser to fuse one point, this is a melt pool that you build. It's like a mountain, okay? Like a volcano, right? So uh, in Earth, we have volcano and a form a particular geometry and uh, of the mountain. Now in the 3D printing, we also use a laser to fuse a specific point and it will generate a mountain and a melt pool as well. So uh, those are the system design with acoustic sensors, spectrum sensors, high speed video, and the layer-wise imaging system. So this is by uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Russo. So now let me dive into the high resolution layer-wise imaging for improving process reliability. 
So this is a this is a, a 3D printing uh, metal PBF system, and uh, we have the control unit and DSLR camera. And we also put the, you see here, the proximity sensors. So every time when the coder, recorder come back to this point, we take a picture. Before printing, after printing, we, we take a picture. And this is a picture we got, example picture. And we also have thermal imaging, so you can get the thermal image. And you can compare whether there are spatters and the images, what are, uh, the melt pool is conforming or not. And uh, you can digitally build up the images, layer-wise images, and then you can see the you know, quality. So this is a part of beautiful Hollywood, and then you can see the distortion is to additional powder bed anomalies. And this is a system design of the thermal camera and also the layer-wise imaging system. So those are the sensing. So sensing, there are different ways to do the sensing and uh, the thermal imaging, uh, optical imaging, and uh, the, the there's those kind of advanced image, uh, sensing and imaging system, they generate a lot of data. Now the next step is to analyze those data, extract useful information about the process and understand where the variability is from and also perform root cause diagnostics. So if that data, we talk about data enabled smart manufacturing. So from the data, we wanna extract useful information and describe the insights and the knowledge and then gain a better understanding of where the, vari uh, where the variation from the system. Uh, and also like uh, you do better control and better actions and there's uh, wisdom in it. So in each phase, we have different kind of algorithms, data, insight, and action. But when it comes to the data and uh, people use AI, so AI is a hard buzzword, and uh, no matter what we do, <laughs> people say AI. And also there are many AI institutes AI stands for artificial intelligence. And uh, so what is the different culture between AI and uh, engineering? So they do have different cultures. Engineers states with machines, systems. So what we are trying to do as an engi uh, engineer, we try to understand the data, extract useful information, and then we optimize the process, systems, and the organization. Computer scientists, they date with uh, computers like uh, codes and algorithms. So work on the computer codes to fit the data. Hopefully the codes will fit into any other data. So those are the different cultures. Who's got you? So it's like the Superman, right? So no matter what problems, people say AI. So like, uh, um, AI tell engineers, easy means I have got you. Engineers say, oh, you got me. Who has got you? Uh, okay, so the real idea or answer is, oh, we need to really have interdisciplinary uh, study, like uh, integrate AI data science with engineering domain knowledge, okay? So if you only have AI without domain knowledge, it will all work. But uh, if, sometimes if you only have domain knowledge, the research can still work. But AI or data science make the, uh, make the engineering models or engineering solutions much better. So that's why we need to connect and doing the interdisciplinary research and discovery. So if it comes to the uh, engineering domain knowledge, we need to, that's industrial engineer, that we need to design experiments. Experiments help us to test test the hypothesis and understand the system and process better. So for example, this is a powder bath and uh, this is a build plate. So in the build plate, we have cylindrical part, we have different geometric part and uh, the blade, engine blade. We also have thin pad. So this is a thin wall structure. So for cylindrical part, you see the power. This is, this is a power we have at a zero level is 340 watt but we vary it by like 25% or 50% reduce and uh, all above. And the scanning velocity, so V0, and then we have minus 25% or minus mm, plus 25% and plus minus 50%. Also there's a hatching space. Hatching space can be bigger or smaller, but we have this impact, how this impact, how and whether those parameters impact the final build. So this answer is we need to, we engineers, we need to do experiments. It's not like uh, you get a deep learning can figure out, right? So 
So this is uh, engineering domain knowledge and engineering uh, solutions. And also if you build a thin wall, thin wall, thin wall means it's a wall and with different thickness and different height. If you build a thin wall with different height, it sometimes because of the weight it can tend to crush the below layers. So in this design experiments, we have different thickness of the thin wall or width of the thin wall and different height of the thin wall. And also you can see the thin wall are placed in different directions. So this arrow direction is the recoder. That means every time you finish a layer, you recoat the, the, the powders in a, in a new layer and then you fuse it again. You see, we place the thin wall in the same direction as this is zero degree as the recoding direction. You can do 60 degrees and you can also do 90 degrees vertically, right? And then how does it impact the final build? So those are the engineering design and also you design the thin wall in different uh, uh, ways. Now, engineering design, you see recoding directions, zero degree, six degree, and 90 degree. And they also have different widths, different hatching space, different height. And you also have different hatching pattern. So all these parameters will impact the final build quality. So this is an image of the final thin wall build. It's a wall, right? With different height. You won't see, it. Uh, if you want to quantify the process variability, you build such things to see how this impacts the final build, whether it collapse or not. So uh, this research actually is, uh, is summarizing this paper. So if you are looking for more mathematical details, you can dive into this paper, which is a recurrence network analysis of design. So you have different designs, and then later you got different quality. So design quality interaction in additive manufacturing. So you have LPBF machine with different thin wall build. Now you can do the image registration, combine the CAD and put it on the top of the XCT. You register the image and see each thin wall and what is the quality inside the build, in, inside each thin wall. And uh, whether they are discontinuities or there are different kind of quality features and how do they relate to the um, the, uh, the design parameters like the height, width, and uh, different process parameters. So this is a uh, DOE and the modeling. And this is a uh, uh, recurrence network to quantify uh, the build uh, the, 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 the data. And then we try to build the relationship. Okay. And uh, so for more details, you can dive into uh, this paper. Now let's have a look at the in situ sensing for AM defect characterization and estimation. So uh, we can characterize the defects in the post build CT scans. You can also link the process condition with defect characteristics in the, in the final build. And uh, there are also process level like in situ modeling, okay, in process modeling from the layer wise image. So we want to build the connection between process conditions, sensor signatures and the defects. So this work actually is summarized in these two papers. And we study the multifactor characteristics of the image profile to characterize the, and detect the defects in additive manufacturing. And also how do you go from process condition to build quality through the modeling and the monitoring of in situ layer wise image. So those are the more details. Now let me uh, give you a little bit uh, like information about multifactor analysis of in situ AM image profile. So this is a AM machine and you build it layer by layer. This is the excess powder and you, when you use the recoder to spray this layer, excess powder will come here. And then you lower down the powder bed you fuse another layer, okay? And uh, this is a build component, the cylindrical part and you can characterize the CT scan image. You can get the CT scan. And now you, we can analyze the CT scan to try to see the multifractal uh, spectrum. And then you can do the image guided like a hollowing T-square and to do the statistic uh, variation uh, modeling. And then it is a defect detection, defect characterization and optimal design. So here we look at uh, different things which is called multifractal characteristics. So in the next few slides, I'm going to introduce what is a multifractal analysis. The multifractal focus on the rough and irregular patterns over multiple scales. For example, if you have a powder bed, if you zoom in, if zoom in again, this shows some kind of patterns and similarities. 
Okay, and how do you quantify those kind of activities? So this is a complex systems approach, and which is well known uh, from uh, Mandelbrot. Okay, and the fractal characteristic of fractal surface of, uh, of metals. Fractals is actually uh, everywhere. So in this study, we actually divide the like the build each layer into multiple scales. Then we look at the uh, what we call the Veronoi cells. So Veronoi cells in, inside each scale, we look at what is inside this build, and then we look at zooming again. We zooming again. Then we look at those characteristics and see how those uh, those, those uh, patterns vary with respect to the scale. So this is basically the idea we want to quantify the multifractal spectrum. So fractal uh, is actually uh, uh, everywhere in the nature. If you look at the mountains, if you look at the trees, so it's, it's a fall and now the trees are turning yellow and the red, the leaves, and it's very beautiful. But if you look at the, uh, the leaves, you will see the multifractal patterns and a tree, different branches. So they have rough edges. And you see this peak is similar to this peak. And if you look at the overall, there's, a, there's a, some kind of rough edges. And it's a non-uniform shapes. So fractal has been uh, studied for the last hundreds of years. And it's not as long as Euclidean. So Euclidean has been studied for uh, more than 2000 years. For example, the man-made structure. So the, like this building. This building is a Penn State industrial engineering building. They are man-made structures by civil engineers and the civil uh, uh, construct, uh, construction workers. So they use the triangles, circles, squares, and all this kind of Euclidean geometry to build these man-made structures. But if you look at the nature and uh, like flowers, trees, mountains, they all show some kind of fractal patterns, okay? It looks similar, but regardless of the magnification. And multifractal means it's not only one fractal, it's actually many fractals. Now I'm gonna show you how fractal works. For example, you have a, platform, right? Now you only do the middle point placement, displacement. That means this is a middle point, right? And then you also have middle point here. And now you're going to randomly displace the middle point. If you randomly displace the middle point, you will be able to see another structure here. And if you iteratively do it again, in another scale, you will get a, a different uh, geometry. And if you do it again, you got a different geometry. And this is the final uh, mountain you may get. So fractal geometry is widely used in the uh, in the uh, in Disney in Hollywood to do those uh, movies, especially they simulate the fire uh, and also mountain, and especially they have uh, some animated movie, and they use fractal to create all these uh, structures. That it's very. Uh, very vivid and very beautiful and very similar to what we have in the real world. And this is uh, hardly uh, done by the Euclidean geometry, but if you use fractal, it's very easy to generate such complex geometry. And uh, in the nature, you also see something very fractal, like uh, this is, uh, uh, you see the, tree, uh, the river branches and they are very fractal. You see, if you zoom in, it's similar to what we see here. And uh, if you, uh, uh, if you have seen lightning before, there, there will be lightning also have the fractal patterns, right? And if you see the gravels, like uh, those kind of structures, it's like a powder and uh, they are very fractal. And we did a simulation study. We randomly generated the points and uh, see what kind of uh, fractal pattern we have. You see from random, single, and the single class matter and line, they all have different multifractal patterns. And if, when it comes to the uh, CT scan, if there are defects, you will see uh, multifractal characteristics uh, related to the frequency or number and the size of the poles. And you can see they all, they can characterize this kind of uh, activities. Now, if you have the fractal characteristics, those are the different kind of fractal patterns. And if we vary the uh, pro process condition, for example, the power, if you minus 25%, minus 50%, and the velocity, you also, this is called scanning velocity because the laser, when lasers start to move, they move in different speed. And then one line, they, they scan one line and the next line, the hedging space sometimes may also be different. This kind of multifractal patterns, they actually, uh, 
show that if you have different process condition, you, you multifractal characteristics will be in different locations. So can we build a, a regression model like a predict based on different process condition to pr predict the multifactor characteristics? Yes, we can. And the R square is more than 94%. Uh, so this is a model diagnostics. You see the residues, they are pretty normal, okay? So this is a first study and then focus on the multifractal patterns in the man additive manufacturing process. Now let me talk about uh, AI. You see the uppers both have A, AI and AM. And um, so my students come to me and say, oh, why not we use AI? So we also have another build, which is a drag link part. Uh, this is the drag link part and uh, printed in seems 3D with intentional defects. Intentional defects, that means those are the intentional defects. We, we have some kind of holes over there. And then we have four layers and we build those kind of defects in these four layers. And uh, the diameter uh, cylindrical defects, like those are cylindrical defects, they have different diameters. And the cubed, and uh, you, you also have cubed, and they also have different uh, uh, size, okay? So different shape and the size of the defect. Now, if we have the layer-wise imaging, can we predict, because we know the ground truth, can we predict what is, uh, where is the defect and how large they are? And it's, it's not as simple like, like you, you put the in-situ image into the black box and it will tell you that, right? So I, I think uh, many deep learning, when I read the papers, they put the image into the, uh, into the deep learning and then they try to get an accuracy. And uh, when, we, uh, when I discussed with, uh, with my team member and I said, oh, you cannot just do that because, because every layer, you see, once you do the editing manufacturing and you got a geometric, a geometry variations because this layer and the next layer, they have different geometry. If you put the, just the image into the black box, into the deep learning, then what's gonna happen? And uh, this layer, you have a powder area. You also have the, uh, have, have the geometry, the, the build geometry. But the build geometry changes, that means your powder area also changes. If you just throw the image into the, uh, into the deep learning neural network and then later AI figured out, I mean, it's gonna be very hard. So, so that's why what I'm saying, uh, AI it needs to be integrated with engineering domain knowledge. So what I, then later I discussed with, uh, with my team uh, member, with my PhD student, I said, maybe we can use the CAD design to put it on the top of the image. And then we register the LI because the, the region of interest is really what we are interested in. We are not really interested in the powder bath outside. We wanna see whether this, build, this layer is okay. And then inside this uh, ROI, we can do the freeform geometry analysis in different ways. So ROI segmentation with the greatest common divisor of the AM layers, then every layer, and if you segment them into sub ROIs, they all have the same number of pixels and with the great GC, GCD of AM layers, then this, now you can do the spatial characterization and now you can put in the different manner in your network. And this is uh, this this idea actually summarized in these two papers. And if you are interested in details, you may uh, refer to these two papers. So so far, uh, I finished the analyze part. Now let's get into the improve improve part. Improve part is more about the the understanding of the process, especially the AM ontology. So ontology Bayesian network. So BN and the causal discovery, we want to understand what is causal relationship. So only by understanding the causal relationship, we can improve the process and do the robust design. So AM ontology is a high level map that is useful to explore and understand the interrelationships of parameters, elements, and variables during the AM process. So you, you have the QA, QA stands for quality assurance. QC is the quality control. So QA, QC requirements, every user has QA, QC requirement. Then we look at the ontology of the AM machine. Okay, ontology represents what engineers know about the process. That is a domain knowledge and also intercorrelations. We have sensor ontology, what kind of sensors to choose to sense a particular phenomena. We also have machine and process uh, ontology. 
that is domain knowledge. But on the other hand, we have Bayesian network. Bayesian network is data driven. We study the probability and the interrelationship, and then we, which can digest the sensing data. And then uh, you learn the structure, learn the parameters. But how do you like really uh, like intertwine or integrate both process? For example, then you, if you connect ontology domain knowledge with Bayesian network, that means you are connect the domain knowledge or integrated domain knowledge with the machine learning method. So then you can answer the question such as what sensor to select? What are the root cause of defects? And uh, this is one paper that we have recently published called ontology driven learning. That means you have an initial network based on the ontology and you also have data. Now you can learn from the data and also like uh, integrate the ontology knowledge and then you generate a new Bayesian network, not just purely learn from the data. And then you do the causal inference and the quality assurance in additive manufacturing. And this is part of the project called uh, AMAZING. So here's AMAZING. AMAZING stands for Additive Manufacturing Analytics and Sensing Using Intelligent Knowledge Graph. Okay, it's, a, it's an amazing project. I had a lot of fun working with my uh, colleagues students and also uh, with my uh, uh, collaborators. So which can, we, we can do a top-down approach, a bottom-up approach. So top-down means users, they have QA, QC requirement, and uh, they have different kind of uh, uh, like application. For example, they want to diagnose, if something wrong, they want to diagnose what caused this. And uh, uh, this is called the diagnostic inference. And also predictive inference means if you know the process conditions, how do you predict what's going to happen? And intercausal, like uh, inside the process, what are the causal inference? And also mixed inference. If you have such applications, you can query, query the domain knowledge, like ontology. And um, you can also use uh, learning in the second box. Now, if you want to build the model, you have to have data, right? So you go to the demand database and then require the sensors and different type of data, discrete data, continuous data. And uh, bottom up means you get the data, you put it in the database, and then based on the data, you learn. And then you do the inference. So if we can integrate top down and bottom up together, and then do the AM analytics and sensing, this is, uh, this is the integration between, uh, integration of um, domain knowledge with uh, AI. On machine learning. So here, I also would like to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, Dr. Prahala Rao, and he did an excellent paper on graph theory and AM simulation. So the paper is listed here, like thermal modeling in metal additive manufacturing using graph theory. It's a very interesting paper and a very, um, very fast simulation compared to the final element. So if you're interested in simulation, I, I strongly suggest you to read this paper. So step one, obtaining the geometry of a part and converting it to the point cloud. You see, you have a point cloud. Now you construct a network graph from the sample, graph, uh, sample nodes. And then obtain the results as temperature array, which shows the temperature history of the part. Okay? And then you're hitting the layer hatch by hatch, diffusion the heat through the part deposition of another layer. Okay? So this is a very uh, creative like idea to do the graph theory for the simulation. Um, yeah, this is a, a very excellent work from my colleague. And now Dr. Prahala Lau is also having an NSF project try to commercialize this, this new simulation tool and uh, really um, uh, amazing work from Dr. Rao. Now, so far we have talked about uh, define uh, the quality challenge, measure the data, analyze the data, and then improve the process. Now, what are the control challenges and how do we do the uh, optimization of the process? So AM is very unique. You see, you have a layer upon layer decision-making. So in layer T minus one, so <clears throat> the state is high. Like uh, this is a state action transition diagram. This S stands for state, A stands for the action. So SH, SM, SL denotes the high, medium, and the low defect state. So if you have a defect probability, there's a probability that this layer has defect. And then based on the state, you can take different actions. 
So you can AW means that uh, you wait and do nothing. And the AM, AL is like you can do the fix. You can come back and fix the, the, the defect part. And AM means uh, small, uh, small M. Uh, this M means machine the whole layer off, like hybrid manufacturing, additive and uh, and uh, and the traditional subtracting. You can you can actually remove this layer and redo it. This is this is different action you can take. But if you are in a in a state, you take a different action. You will have a serious like uh, state action transitions. So different state, you choose different action. It will cause the subsequent uh, state to change in the last layer and also the subsequent layers. The sequential optimization is that you have sensors and then you do the sensing and then you quantify the defect level. And then you do the, we call it MDP, Markov decision process. You wanna every step to be optimal. So that's the Markov decision process for image guided additive manufacturing. So the detailed mathematics, uh, uh, mathematical detail modeling details are available in these two papers. And I, we even consider the uh, constraint Markov decision process. That means when you are making the decision, you are constrained by a lot of factors. For example, you cannot do like uh, uh, the repair for every layer, right? You have a certain budget to do the repair. And then how do you, under this budget, how do you maximize the probability that this this build, the final build, we have no defect. And when, when, we, when we characterize or quantify the defect state, the defect state, there is a probability. That means the past layer and the present layer and the future layer, you, you have a mean and also you have uncertainty, uncertainty uh, quantification of how likely is this layer to have a defect. And uh, if you define the solid, uh, failure threshold, they, then you will have a probability that this layer to fail. So this is a sequential decision-making process. But first, we need to have a sensor-based model to characterize and quantify the uncertainty of the failure probability. And based on the quantification, for example, you have AM build, you have sensors. Now you can quantify the state. And the state will give you different kind of uh, uh, action and a reward. And uh, then the decision agent, based on the reward and the state that you are in right now, and then choose a new action. And then you continue to sense and state and then reward, then, then decision agent. So the decision agent stands for uh, the MDP agent. So the sig state is a defect signal and uh, with uncertainty. Now action you can take here, we consider two actions, take corrective action or wait and do nothing because wait and do nothing is also an action. Right, it causes subsequent uh, uh, behaviors. The cost, the cost is the cost of the corrective action and the cost of waiting. And uh, if the final build fa failed and then you have a failure cost, that's pretty high. So if, for, if you are in a particular state and you can see you have state transitions and the, well, once you get in the new state, you will have a value associated with a new state. And uh, also you take an action. Now this action also has a, a cost. But if the state is greater than the uh, failure threshold, then you have a failure cost. So this is the optimal control policy we derived. And uh, this, is, this work is done by Professor Bing Yao, uh, one of my former PhD student, who is now an assistant professor at Oklahoma State. And she has done excellent work to uh, consider the historic data and also sequential decision-making. And uh, then he said the, the, whether we should take corrective action or we should wait. Okay, so if you are below this, 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 this line and the policy is you wait and uh, continue the observation, if you're above, then take corrective actions. And uh, here is when you consider the failure cost and action cost. And sometimes failure cost is not that high, right? So uh, compared to the uh, action cost, then you will have uh, much, uh, uh, you will have a different kind of uh, levels of the con control limit for different layers. This really depends on what is the cost and of the final build. If you have a very uh, important or, or critical parts, you need your failure cost is very high. But if you have a consumer grade product, then the failure cost may not be that high. Okay, uh, now let me summarize uh, this talk. AM additive manufacturing provides new design freedoms so previously, what do we have? We have subtractive manufacturing. We need to design 
to make subtractive manufacturing or traditional manufacturing possible. Because if you design very complex part, the, sub, the manufacturing may not be possible, right? But now uh, additive manufacturing enable a new paradigm called manufacturing for design. That means any complex geometry, any complex designs, additive manufacturing give you the freedom to manufacture that. So this is a paradigm, sh a paradigm shift from design for manufacturing to manufacturing for design. Uh, design complexity makes quality control actually very challenging. And the complexity of engineering designs, we need also need new qualification methods and tools. So institute sensing and online monitoring is one uh, possible solution actually, and uh, compared to the post-build quality inspection. So realize the full potential of sensing data depends really on the new models and the new algorithms for sensor-guided AM. So this is what we propose, DMAIC. Traditional, this is very classical uh, IE methodology, methods and tools. But uh, I think when, when we consider traditional DMAIC, DMAC, we didn't really consider those kind of in-process sensing or in process, uh, once the, those kind of high dimensional sensing. And uh, so DMAC can be extended to incorporate the advanced sensors. And we can study the design and the build quality relationship uh, interactions then characterize the defects, link process condition with defect characteristics. And then we can also do the process modeling and then the sequential optimization. So this is uh, all the reference and uh, um, uh, relate to this talk. And if you're interested in some of the uh, topics, uh, please um, feel free to refer to those papers. And acknowledgement, and I would like to thank NSF and especially my career award and uh, uh, my colleague and my collaborators, my students, and NSF Center for eDesign. And, and Sesame uh, List, Lock, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin actually is the first company who sponsored the image guided like AM project like uh, about five years ago. That really got me started to study AM. So very much thank uh, uh, Lockheed Martin. This is my contact information. And uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to talk with my uh, fellows and uh, friends, colleagues in the QCIE community. And uh, yeah, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for the excellent presentation. So any questions from the audience? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Yang, thank you for this inspiring talk. It's uh, really eye-opening for many of us. Um, so I think there's a this presentation is already really comprehensive. So what do you think will be the next big problem in AM, AM to solve. I think we have uh, quite a few junior faculty or graduate students here. So I think they can benefit. And I, I want to know personally a lot uh, about your advice on that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Ling, uh, Dr. Bian, and uh, it's a really good question. And uh, also a uh, forward looking question because this AM um, right now is a, a rapidly developing field and uh, also a lot of research uh, ongoing in AM. Uh, I, I think uh, AM really changed the traditional manufacturing uh, paradigms and actually entering a new manufacturing paradigms. There are many issues to be, uh, or many research questions that can be, uh, should be, or uh, will be investigated by many colleagues. Uh, I, I, I think it can also be well connected with uh, traditional IE methods. Uh, when it comes to the AM, we see new challenges, right? So for example, traditional high volume, no mix. We have a lot of parts to quantify the variability, but when it comes to the low volume, high mix, or one of a kind of manufacturing, I mean, it's very difficult for IE, traditional methodology to be applicable to quantify such variability. And uh, we have excellent researchers in the QCIE communities. And I, uh, I think this is a great opportunity for us really to contribute. And uh, because when, when traditional manufacturing gets started and it started from mechanical uh, community, mechanical engineering community, then I, I jump in and uh, try to help because we make things, once, uh, once, uh, 
once uh, we, we can make it possible, right? And now it's uh, IE to make really improve the quality, improve the reliability, and uh, make sure the production process, the, the variability is smaller and we can have high quality part. So those kind of new challenges really uh, need, really motivate IE uh, industrial engineers to, to think about uh, uh, how to develop traditional IE methods and tools. And then um, really develop them, design them, those new new ideas, and then contribute to the additive manufacturing. This, this is not just limited to the quality engineering. If you look at the supply chain, if you look at the design of experiments, you look at the engineering statistics, analytics community, if you look at the OR, like uh, operations research, um, how, how can we uh, like uh, connect traditional OR methodology and also develop those OR methodology and then contribute to the optimization of uh, additive manufacturing. I think that there, there are a lot to be done. And uh, um, this is just, this presentation is just my two cents. Uh, my pioneer is studying this area. I, I think uh, many QCI uh, engineers and uh, colleagues, they have, they have excellent ideas and I think they can, uh, they can really contribute to this field if they are interested in uh, additive manufacturing. Yeah. Now, there are many interesting problems to be investigated in this uh, new manufacturing paradigm. So yeah, and if we can really uh, like in, uh, implement and uh, improve the quality of AM, I think uh, uh, the manufacturing is going to be different in the next two decades. Thank you, Dr. Yan. I think that's definitely a $2 million, at least $2 million idea, more than two cents. I appreciate uh, sharing the thoughts with us. Yeah. Great. Um, hello, Dr. Yan. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you did any work or looked at support structures and their effect on the part quality. Um, oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, did I interrupt you? Do you have further questions? No, that's all. Well, I was just going to say when I'm setting up builds, I always try to support more than less, you know, mm -hmm. just because I don't want to fail build. So I was yeah. wondering if you looked at strategies for that. Uh, if you look at the thin wall build, thin wall build actually, they have different kind of support. And because their width is different, then support will be different. If you're too thin, it's very hard to support at the top level, high, uh, higher thin walls. So you will see the quality will be different. And that's one support structure for thin wall. And recently, we are also looking at the supporting structures uh, for the for different geometry, especially. And then we look at the, the layer-wise imaging and also the melt pool and with different kind of support structure and how will it impact the quality and also the geometry uh, variations in the final build. Now that's a very good question. And uh, it, it takes a lot of like uh, research efforts to really um, optimize and uh, understand the support structures. But uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, ongoing work. And also uh, the one work on the scene will actually consider the uh, support structure. But uh, that's also an open field. I, I strongly encourage you to investigate more. If you have uh, interesting papers to share, like uh, please feel free like to reach out to me and I will be happy to like provide my two cents uh, or learn from you guys about uh, supporting structure. Of course, thank you so much. Thank you. So any other questions we have? It's already four and six. So if we, there's no more questions, uh, I would like to thank all the um, audience for joining us today. And uh, this uh, video has been recorded. We are going to share uh, it uh, using our QCRE uh, social media. And finally, I would like to thank Dr. Yang again for this great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. And it's my great pleasure to interact with you guys online today. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your day and the rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.